Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out this year to the 32nd Annual Florida Film Festival. Uh, my name is Tim Anderson. I'm the programming coordinator. And this is Queering the Screen, the Progression of Representation. This is a panel that we put together because this year's Florida Film Festival has an exceptionally large number of LGBT and queer content in it. And it's something that we're very, very proud of. Um, and it's also the kind of panel that by being able to put these content creators together that we hope can begin to illustrate not just the past of what has gone on in representation in cinema and media, but also where we stand today and where we hope to go in the future. Um, it's really my distinct honor to do this panel. And it's a panel that um, we were just previously talking about that we, uh, we think is more important than ever, specifically in light of what has been going on recently in the state as well as throughout the United States. And the dream is that someday we don't have this panel at all because that we don't need to have this panel. So I am um, personally very, very excited to welcome the filmmakers here that are going to represent their movies. Uh, but before we get started, we just have a short clip reel for you to take a look at some of the projects that they've worked on this year. So thank you so much for joining us. After uh, about a 30 minute kind of interaction between our panelists, we'll open up to audience questions. There will be a microphone available. We would ask you to please ask your question into the microphone because Orlando Live, who is streaming this, will not be able to pick up your question uh, without the microphone. So thank you so much. Have an incredible morning. Thank you so much for coming out and for um, really testifying here by being with us as well. So. Almost daily, I see people walking up and down the street, two girls, two guys, holding hands. 30 years ago, it was not like that. There was a time in, in my life when I felt like being gay was, was an absolute curse. I was afraid that I'd be ostracized. I thought I was just a black trans girl and nobody saw me. You no longer could sit back and be complacent. You had to be a part of the change or get out of the way. I have no choice to participate. Going to the courthouses, infiltrating those, and standing up. Progress can be taken away. Pulse was my safe space. And that is when my advocacy began. I'm very picky when it comes to it, so I, it always has to be like perfect. It always takes me like a couple tries. After not like being happy with myself for so long, and now that I finally like am getting there, I want to show it off. Yeah. Yeah. We got it. The Evan Bielasuknia. Evan Bielasuknia. For making history as her school's first transgender homecoming queen. It's just insane how one night of homecoming game can change the whole student body and like everyone. Hi, my name is Evan Balasuknia. I want to show the world who I am. I'm just showing support for my best friend who is super cool and gay and unique. And you could even say that she is a fruit loop in a world of Cheerios. A fruit loop. I don't know. I saw it on a t-shirt once. Listen up, Twinkie. I am proud of you. And you are a totally cool, legit lesbian. Not that I'm an expert in that field. <laughs> but the point is, you don't have to prove yourself to me. You don't have to prove yourself to your parents. You don't have to prove yourself to anyone. And I will wear this costume every day if that is what makes you feel better because seeing you upset is like the worst thing in the world. Then honestly, you're very scary when you're pissed off. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is George Wallace. I am the CEO at the LGBT Plus Center Orlando, where some of Rick's film was was done. So I'm appreciative of being here. Um, I want everyone to introduce themselves, and um, I'll start with Rick. 
I'm Rick Todd. I am the uh, owner and publisher of Watermark, which is Central Florida and Tampa Bay's LGBTQ news source. We have a newspaper we put out every two weeks, about 13 magazines we do throughout the year, a website we update daily and that kind of thing. And I am also the executive producer of Greetings from Queertown, Orlando. Uh, my name is Jess Keller. I am a director and cinematographer here in Orlando. I was the director of Greetings from Queertown and just very fortunate that uh, Rick trusted me to tell that story. Hi, my name is Sarah Conbe Holland. I'm an independent filmmaker based in Orlando. I wrote and, direct, wrote and directed Egghead and Twinkie, which is my debut feature and uh, very passionate about LGBTQ representation, so happy to be here today. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ariel Mahler. I'm an independent uh, writer, director, currently based in Los Angeles. Um, I'm currently a fellow at the American Film Institute in Los Angeles, and I'm one of the co-directors and co-producers of Evan Ever After, which is a short documentary screening here at the Florida Film Festival about Evan Balasuknia, who was a, um, her school's first ever trans homecoming queen. So. Hi, my name's Marnie Balasuknia. I'm Evan's mom, and I'm here uh, just to support the film and kind of here by default. Um, Ariel's uh, producing partner and directing partner, Rada, couldn't be here today, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. And I just have to say that visibility and representation is so important. So thank you for your films and for, um, I got to see them all. I got to screen them at home and um, I was moved by each and every one in different ways. I'm gonna start with you, Rick. The 2016 Pulse tragedy opened your film. Was that the catalyst for the film or was this a passion project that you had long before Pulse? Well, I, I love history uh, and I love telling people's stories. So that's always been something we'd like to do. And that's why I love my job at Watermark. I, I've been there 21 years and, and every two weeks we're featuring different people to tell their stories and I love that. But the, the idea for putting this into a documentary, uh, did it was born out of that tragedy. Um, there was a, a, a group of people assembled in, in the hours following that, that massacre. And it was executive directors, presidents of boards, uh, anyone involved in the LGBT community uh, that had access to resources all got together and created this Facebook group that would answer um, calls for help. And it was just this beautiful thing to see that somebody would go on there and say, we've got a survivor that needs a ride to, to therapy or needs a ride to a doctor's appointment. And within minutes, somebody had it. I know one time there was someone who had family coming in from out of town and nowhere to stay. And within minutes, there were hotel rooms available to them. And it was just this incredible, um, you know, just group of people helping. And I thought, this didn't just happen. You know, this was something that's been in the works for decades for us to be able to handle something like this so quickly. And that's where it kind of started, right? And then in 2017, in February, I think it was, uh, the, the series When We Rise uh, showed on TV. And I just loved it. I loved the, that they're the strength of, especially the women uh, during that time who were like, I'm gonna grab a sign and I'm gonna go into a park and I'm gonna say, I deserve rights and I'm probably gonna get beat up for it, but I don't care because it's important. And I thought that was incredible. And I thought, I know that that happened here in Orlando. I know that there are people who did this. And we all know the people in New York, and you know, we know like Cleve Jones, who's amazing, uh, who, who created the pride flag and the AIDS quilt. Um, but there are people fighting those battles locally in every city that no one has ever heard of. Uh, so that was the real driving force at that point to say it is time to start pulling this all together to tell the stories of our community. And the same question for you, uh, Jen, at the end, Ariel and Marnie. What was the catalyst for, for the film? So um, a lot of the credit for this film 
goes to my co-director and co-producer, Radha, who heard about Evan's story. Because when Evan was elected homecoming queen, it made national news. Um, I don't know if many of you, if any of you have gotten a chance to see the documentary, but you'll see that she was featured on Ellen. She met the Kardashians. She kind of was all over the place in the news. And Evan heard about it because, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Radha, my co-director, heard about it because she's from Orlando. And a friend of hers had reached out and told her about the story, um, at which point Radha connected with Marnie and then was really interested. Um, Radha comes from a documentary filmmaking background and was really interested in coming down here to tell Evan's story. But because Radha identifies as a cisgender heterosexual ally, she wanted to bring on you know, trans folks to represent and be able to accurately tell the story. So she and I are really good friends um, from the American Film Institute, and so she reached out to me to, to work together and, uh, and co-direct. And we just, yeah, we just were incredibly inspired by Evan's journey and by Marnie's incredible support. Um, I know that when I was, you know, a very closeted trans high schooler in the early 2000s, I never even imagined that I could experience anything like what Evan had. Um, you know, my earliest memories of something that was, you know, transgender was that it was a mental illness, there was something wrong with you, it was something where you were gonna end up, you know, dead in the streets. It was really not something that I saw as a possibility for myself. And so then getting to see Evan and getting to see someone who is is so young and is just living her truth unapologetically without caring what anybody thinks was just really inspiring. And so I was really excited to have the opportunity to come down here um, with Radha a little, a little more than a year ago now um, to, to tell her story and also to tell the story of Marnie, who is the most amazing, supportive mother that any trans kid could want. Um, yeah, it's really incredible. So um, yeah, that's the, that's the brief version of the story. And Marnie, can we have a, a quick life update? Where is Evan and how are they doing now? And so Evan uh, is a finishing up, just about to finish up her freshman year at FAU in Boca. And she will be coming home tomorrow to go to their premiere on Saturday. So she's very excited. She texted me that she had to get her nails done yesterday. <laughs> she's she's got to be on point. Um, and, uh, you know, she she's doing well. I mean, it's, you know, I came, it was always interesting to me that Rada reached out to me and I was like, kind of what Tim had said at the beginning, like, this is newsworthy. Like, this really shouldn't be newsworthy. And I think that was one of the first things I said in one of the first interviews when Evan was elected homecoming queen. I think someone can fact check me, but I think she's the first transgender homecoming queen in the state of Florida, which was why it became, I mean, blew up so quickly. Um, like, it really shouldn't be newsworthy, right? Like, she just won homecoming queen, just like any other girl would win homecoming queen. Um, and I think it's actually now even more of a of an issue and more important of a story to tell in light of what is going on in the last year compared to when she won almost two years ago. So um, I was just really excited that Rada reached out and, you know, a little nervous not knowing what to expect. This is a whole different, you know, whole different world for me um, and for our family. So um, we're really excited to be here. Thank you so much. Sarah, every kid growing up, every queer kid needs a Twinkie in their life. So tell me about the character. Tell me about the character development and where did that come from? Because if I'm not mistaken in my research, it was originally a short film and then you made the feature based off of the short film. Correct, yeah. Egghead and Twinkie started off as a short uh, that we also shot here in Florida. Both projects were shot entirely in Florida with Florida cast and crew. Um, the original idea came to me when I was 19 years old. It was a couple months after I'd come out to my own parents. And uh, I was like, wow, that was a really terrifying experience. <laughs> Thankfully, it went over pretty OK. But you know, it's really nerve wracking in the moment. You don't know how it's going to go until you do it. Um, so I was really interested to make a comedy about the coming out process, uh, just to try to find the heart and humor in what is oftentimes a really difficult situation for queer people. Uh, just because I think that that can be empowering, you know, to be able to laugh at the things that scare us. Um, so that's really where the initial idea came from, was wanting to make a comedy about that process and then start it off as a short and then use that proof of concept to expand out the story into a full-length feature. Thank you. Uh, Rick, 
Jess, and Sarah, all of your films had some type of animation in it. So tell me a little bit about incorporating the animation into the film and um, specific, uh, specifically on Egghead and Twinkie. I thought it was so beautiful. Yours was as well. But yours was beautiful. And who did that artwork? Oh, that was our amazing animation team, uh, Jill Cefalo Sanders and Dustin Wish. Um, both are also queer artists, which is awesome. Uh, and they're based in Cleveland, so that interaction, like that uh, workflow, was entirely remote, like done through Zoom, which was amazing. Um, and basically, it's a lot of like animation, 2D animation overlays that were then put on top of live action footage. Uh, and it did involve quite a bit of rotoscope and tracking as well, uh, which was all new to me. I'd never worked with animators before. So it was kind of a learning experience for both of us, you know, in terms of that intersection between like live action and animation. But it was so much fun. And I really wanted animation in the film from the very beginning, because I just love animation. I love watching animated movies. And I wanted it to be like a visual representation of how Twinkie, the central character, feels throughout the film. So not only are we seeing that on her face, but we're also seeing her feelings, her emotions, her crushes, like through all of this animation that is kind of peppered throughout the film. Yeah, and with, with Queer Town, we had a, a, a unique issue where we have these stories that we're trying to tell that happened a long time ago before you could just you know pick up a cell phone and record it or so we were we were lacking in that so I want to Jess had this idea so I want her to explain it um, on how to, to compensate for that yeah I mean there's only so many routes you can go right I mean archival footage will only get you so far when somebody's telling this emotional heartfelt story um, most of these things don't even have photos or footage attached to them and then of course you know reenactment is a really traditional route that we did consider but budget wise it was just something that just wasn't making sense we really wanted to capture just not only the reality of what happened but also the emotional core of what happened and um, i got really inspired by this vice documentary that i saw about the yakuza very different subject matter however um they in a really clever way they used these almost like painterly stills to tell the story of these men's past, which is obviously very illegal and also does not have footage, right? Um, but I went to the illustrator at Watermark High, and we also had remote collaboration as well with those because you know, Kai had a million things going on. I was crazy busy, but you know, we were able to talk about like, okay, how can we translate this rather dark inspiration source material but make it something that's more colorful, more painterly, something that just captures like the main emotional beats of the story. So the process basically involves saying like, okay, here's the section that we really feel needs to be brought to light. And what are the core beats that we want to make almost a pseudo animation from? So once we identified those, you know, I worked with him to really fine tune the moments and I think it added a lot to the story. Thank you. Rick, with Orlando's queer history being so rich, uh, as you alluded to earlier, how did you decide who to feature in this film? Oh, that's a, that is a great question. Um, it was not easy. You know, I when I entered into this project, I think in, in 2017, is we had this event, and it was sort of a fundraiser. I had worked with a, a production team to create a fundraising trailer and we're like let's go out there and let's raise two hundred thousand dollars and we're going to make this hour and 45 minute long documentary and it's going to be great and um and it <laughs> it just doesn't work that way <laughs> you know it turns out not everybody's wanting to write you a ten thousand dollar check so it didn't uh, so then we we started scaling back now when adrenaline films came into the picture um because i you know I had never made a film before, and it was just getting stalled year after year, and COVID played a part of that. But uh, once we got introduced to Adrenaline Films, where Jess worked at the time, uh, we, you know, things, things started moving along. So they, they told me pretty early on in this process, you know, with your resources, you're looking at a 45-minute, you know, documentary. And so from that, uh, I think we must have interviewed, I don't know, 25 at least 25, 30 people, it seems. At least, at least. And yeah. Yeah, and I think the thing that was kind of interesting about it is that, you know, there are a couple, I mean, anyone who's been in the Orlando queer community long enough knows that there are some pretty iconic names and faces, many of which we did feature, but we also kind of wanted to take the opportunity, like I was very interested in the idea of 
and, and I talked about this at the screening on Monday, but telling the story in these individual driven vignettes. So you start with one person's personal story, their coming of age or their coming out, and then how that translates into a whole decade of history. So we really did our best to try to, you know, choose primary interview subjects that were not only influential, but also um, as intersectional as humanly possible, you know, especially with some of the older decades, it's challenging. Yeah, and then we did, you know, and, and where we couldn't, so we, you know, I, of course we wanted to, to interview everyone and tell everyone's story, but when we picked the, the stories that we were gonna tell through these vignettes, we tried to, throughout the documentary, include photos of people uh, and organizations. For example, we don't talk about the Central Florida Softball League, which is huge in the development of the LGBT community here in, in gay sports. So what we what we tried to do was feature photos of them throughout and photos of people uh, who were extremely important to getting um, you know, Chapter 57 passed and things like that. So. Thank you so much. Music is also an important piece of, of films. I think music can move you as much as, as what is on the screen. So I am going to start down at the end with Ariel. Tell me, um, how did you pick the music that was, was in your film, and, and was that something that Evan had a hand in a lot? Yeah, so a lot of the music was definitely inspired by Evan and inspired by TikTok. Um, if you, again, if you've seen the film, you'll know that when we, when we went down to um, start filming with Evan, we realized that TikTok is a huge part of her life and we wanted to represent that authentically. So there, we have little like TikTok vignettes throughout the film where we show actual TikToks that Evan has filmed. Um, and that's been a big part of how she's gone viral. So we wanted to incorporate that as well. Um, now we're of course trying to do our due diligence in terms of legality. So we didn't want to throw in the real, like a lot of times she's using real songs that are out there and are copyrighted that we don't have access to. So we wanted to try to find music that represented kind of the tone and the theme of what the TikToks actually were without worrying about copyright law or issues. So we just, you know, we found, I, we have just a shout out to my amazing editor who's not here with us, but Gia Wan, who's um, another uh, American Film Institute fellow, she has access to just like all of this licensing free music that you can find. So we just would spend, you know, hours together at her apartment, like Googling like pop, acoustic pop, like <laughs> R&B pop, and just like listening to all of this music until we found something that felt like it matched um, Evan's kind of aesthetic. And Sarah, for you? Yeah, music was a really huge part of it. Um, we had licensed music uh, and as well as, you know, a completely original score. Um, so with the licensed music, oh my God, I did not realize how difficult it is <laughs> to get the rights to songs until I was trying to do it for about like eight different songs. And you're having to like chase people down at the record company to get them to take your money. I don't know. It's <laughs> it's a process. Um but I wanted to highlight a lot of indie bands that I really enjoyed listening to um, and build out, you know, that like teen road movie iconic soundtrack that I had always longed for. So I really enjoyed um, building out the soundtrack. And then the process of working with our composer, Ben Thornwell, was just amazing. Um, he's actually the lead singer in one of my favorite like indie pop bands, uh, Jukebox the Ghost. So I kind of had like a fangirl moment <laughs> when uh, he, he agreed to do the score for us. And it was his first time ever composing a score for a feature and he killed it. Uh, I remember when I watched the movie for the first time with score, I actually got a little bit choked up because I was like, oh my God, it's like a real movie now. Because you know, music can really move you in that way. So we really lucked out in finding Ben. Thanks. And, and for um, Team Watermark over here, you had an original song done by Ginger Minj um, that closed. Um, it, is it, I believe, called City Beautiful? And um, has the mayor heard that? And is this going to be the official song of Orlando? <laughs> what, what's going on? He did hear it because he did was it? there Good. on Monday. <laughs> so I hope he appreciated that. Yeah, um, myself, Rick, and our producer, Tiana, like we emotionally bonded over that song so much. Like if we were having a difficult day or needed a little bit of inspiration, we just put that on and like feel our feelings over Zoom, you know? <laughs> but um, we were incredibly lucky um, that Ginger Minch was willing to create that beautiful piece of art. We were incredibly lucky to, to, to get Ginger. Well, Ginger's local, so we just reached out and, and I said, listen, we're working on this project and we want you to be part of it. I think it would really help if there was something 
in it that was just true to Orlando. And so they got me in touch with the, um, with the songwriter on the album that Ginger had just put out. And uh, he just loved it. I sent him uh, the first version of the film that we had come up with. And I just said, I want something that honors the people because it's the people in this community that make Orlando the city beautiful. And if you've heard the song, you know he nailed it. It just absolutely hits that point. And it's got this, this is me vibe from, from The Greatest Showman. And it's just powerful and it's catchy. And if you hear it once, you will sing it all day. And it is that good. It is probably my favorite thing about this. Uh, in fact, when the trailer started back there, I didn't know how much it was going to play. And I looked at Jess and I'm like, are we going to hear the song? <laughs> <laughs> I was like so excited. I just love it. And to hear it in the, you know, the first time, what was it, Monday is when the show premiered, we got to hear, it plays throughout the credits. And that's where we try to put as many people, we try to show the faces of the people who make this community in the credits to, to honor as many people as we can. And with seeing their faces and so many of them have passed and seeing and hearing that song, it's just, it was really emotional in a theater with it being super loud. It was amazing. So. Sarah, what is next for Head and Twinkie, are you going to be going to other festivals? And what is what is um, going to happen next with the film? We are going to other festivals. Uh, we're going to the Seattle International Film Festival in May, uh, so that should be fun. And then uh, we're going to Frame Line uh, in San Francisco this summer, uh, and a few more. We're still waiting to hear back from. But uh, the hope is to get distribution so we can get this thing out there and on streaming and accessible to young people to be able to watch it. So uh, TBD, we'll see how that goes. And Ariel, for you, the same question. Yeah, so um, this is our world premiere at the Florida Film Festival, which is very exciting, but we have a few others scheduled as well. So we're going to be, um, our international premiere is going to be at Northwest Fest, which is a wonderful documentary festival up in Edmonton, Canada. Um, and then we're going to be screening at Inside Out, which is an LGBTQ film festival in Toronto. We're going to be at Coney Island Film Festival. Um, and then similarly, we're waiting to hear back from some as well. But I think the goal with Evan Ever After is to use it really as a proof of concept for a bigger piece. Um, we've talked about doing maybe a docu-series where each episode focuses on a different queer trans youth, perhaps specifically in states where legislation is getting more and more challenging, unfortunately, for trans young people. But um, yeah, we've built a really incredible team. Our cinematographer, Leo, is here right here in the front row. Um, and then myself and, and Rada and Gia, we've all like formed this really amazing team around this film. And so we're hoping to continue that family and to make this into something more. Thank you. And, and Rick, for you, where is Queer Town going next? Well, our plan is to, is to apply for as many festivals as we can, we can get to. Uh, my, my focus being so sort of homegrown based was let's get into the Florida Film Festival. When we were making it, I was like, I really want it to to start at the Florida Film Festival uh, because I've, I've just grown up with it and I wanted this film to start here. So now, I mean, we've applied to some other ones that, that hopefully we're gonna get into. Uh, as far as, as Queer Town as a concept, when we were filming this uh, fundraising trailer, we were interviewing Michael Wanzi at, at Lake Eola and he had this fantastic line that was, um, just like every person, every city has its own coming out story. And every city's got people who fought for their rights and all of those stories should be told. So we, as soon as we heard that, we were just kind of like, this needs to be, cause it was greetings from queer town. And at that moment yeah. it became greetings from queer town, Orlando. And we would love to travel, travel the country and telling the stories of you know, people from Detroit or Dallas or wherever. Yeah. I was surprised because, you know, when Rick came to adrenaline and I basically took the concept and kind of set about developing it. I did a lot of research, you know, just to try to find more inspiration for the film. And I was telling Sarah this before um, the event this morning, but I was shocked at how little, like, aside from San Francisco, of course, or big cities like San Francisco, New York, I was shocked at how little queer history documentary content that's not based around a single individual existed out there. Shocked. I mean, I found um, a project from Chicago that really inspired me. But it was funny because like Rick was kind of already on that page before I even came into the picture. And then as I was developing the project, it kind of became apparent to me that like this is easily something that you could use to elevate stories all over the country, possibly. I think that's the dream. 
Great. And when is the next screening for Queer Town? Um, we screen this Saturday, the 22nd, at 1245 PM, which I really wish I could pitch, but I think we're all sold out, of course, with Evan Ever After as well. So oh, I don't know. Fantastic. Yeah, Congratulations. <laughs> And Sarah, how about Egghead and Twinkie? Where is that going to be? We're showing tonight, tonight. Uh, at the Enzian at 9.15 p.m., which I know is late, but it would be great if you could all come out. <laughs> well, I have to say that all of the films were, were um, definitely worth it. So if you have an opportunity to see um, any or all, please go and, and see it. And I guess it is sold out, but when is the next screening of your film? Yeah, so we're we're paired um, with Welcome to Queer Town, so it's uh, it's also on uh, Saturday. Fantastic. Well, I'm actually, I um, didn't know I was moderating this, so I bought tickets. And so I'm going to I'm gonna see it on Saturday as well. I'm excited at, at the Enzion. Um, now that you maybe have the film bug, um, talking about maybe doing other things, do you think, Rick, that you're going to expand on the story here in Orlando? Um, because there are so many stories still to be told. I, I would love the opportunity to. I mean, you know, the idea to travel around and, and do greetings from Queertown Orlando is there. But also, I mean, as a there's also the dream to expand this project, you know, and maybe this could be a five part series. It's five part series on Netflix, on Amazon, about and really get involved in the you know, we talk about these four different decades, but what if we did each decade as its own separate thing? Uh, I'm all about it. I love the city, so you know, I'll I'll, I'll any documentary we can make about it, I'm up for it. And there's so many stories. I mean, just the process of trying to figure out what to prioritize. You know, I constantly had to try to comfort Rick, like, God, just trust us. It's going to be okay. <laughs> because there's there's so much to choose from. There are. And you did a beautiful job narrowing down. That's why I asked earlier about who you chose, because um, I, I think it was um, exceptional representation of, of the community here in Orlando. It's been part of my coming out and coming up um you know i just celebrated living in this city for 25 years so yeah so thank you yeah and if i can for just a second i just want to let you all know how amazing uh jess is when she told me in this in this project she said they're, they're like yeah you're gonna get about 45 minutes and i was like what interviewed two people and she kept <laughs> She kept calming me down and she's like, she's like, trust me, you can get a lot of information in 45 minutes. And I didn't, I, I didn't know how that was all going to work out. And, you know, and I was like, well, here's the 30 people we're going to talk to. And she's like, you get one per decade. Like, come on. And she's working with me. And, but when I saw that first, that, I mean, I can't even describe the feeling when I saw that first thing. It's, and I said this at the thing on Monday and I always say it, it's like she crawled in my head and said, this is what his dream is, and I know how to make that happen on film. And she, and she did that. It was incredible. I just loved it. So. Sarah, what is next for you? Because if I'm not mistaken, you um, have a degree in, in film. So what is going to be next for you? I do have a degree in film. Uh, not teaching at the moment. Um, I am actually directing commercial work for an ad agency at the moment. So... Uh, selling out a little bit. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, got to pay your bills. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm starting to ruminate ideas for my next feature. So that's that's uh, got a couple ideas in the works. I don't know. Egghead and Twinkie go to college. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Listen, multiple people have tried to pitch me on Egghead and Twinkie, the sequel. I'm not entirely sold yet, but we'll see. <laughs> Actually, shout out real quick on that note. We're both UCF film alums, so it's kind of fun. We sort of were missed each other just barely. But Yeah, go Knights. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Ariel, what is next for, for you and your, your career? Yeah, so um, I'm about to be graduating from AFI uh, in August, and so my current thing that I'm, I'm really deep in is uh, my AFI thesis film, which I feel like I'm the queen of shoutouts, but my producer's here as well, Elida. So um, yeah, so we're, we're deep in development for Thesis, which is a narrative short film, um, which we're going to be shooting in June. And so then once that's over, just, you know, jumping off into the industry. But I had such a great time working on this documentary. So I'm hoping to continue um, kind of doing a blend of narrative work as well as documentary work, but always with an eye toward, you know, furthering trans stories and queer representation. 
Great. So, so my last question before we open it up to the audience is is about queer representation um, and the the um, importance. But, but tell me about queer representation in your work and and why it's important to you. Yeah, I think um, you know I, I'm hoping that we're moving toward a place where we can be seeing queer and trans characters on screen who have the rich diversity of stories and experiences beyond what we typically see in, you know, in the media, like coming out stories, stories where queer pain and queer trauma are the central conflict of the, of the film. You know, I think we're, we're used to seeing that kind of stuff. And, and sure, there is a place for that. Like, I, I don't want to tell any queer or trans filmmaker not to do your work. Um, but what I'm hoping to push myself in moving forward is a place where we can have queer and trans representation across genre, across theme, across settings, um, without, you know, I think there are folks who would consider like trans film a genre in and of itself, which I don't necessarily think that's true. I think that trans people exist and we exist across genres. Like where's the trans rom-com? Where's the trans horror films? Where are the trans, you know, action superhero movies. Someday I want to make the first trans Transformers movie, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm excited about is, is finding ways to sort of push the boundaries of what we typically think of when we hear trans, um, trans media and trans film. And I also think that that, it, what I, what I want to do is to extend that to beyond just characters on screen. So I try as much as I can when I'm on set to have queer and trans voices represented behind the camera as well, so that we have majority queer and trans folks who are telling queer and trans stories so that it really feels like an authentic, nuanced um, experience. Thank you. And Sarah, for you as well, but not only queer representation, but Asian American queer representation. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes natural because it's like, well, I'm queer and mixed Asian, so, you know, it's it's not too far removed from my own experience. You know, I, I just always want to tell authentic stories from a real place. Um, and so that's what my perspective is. And it's easier for me to write from that perspective. And I also know how much it means to people because, you know, growing up, I didn't see myself reflected in stories on screen. And it does make you feel like your story doesn't really matter. Um, so with Egghead and Twinkie specifically, you know, in addition to being a queer story and an Asian American story, um, I wanted it to be a youth centered story. Um, and for Twinkie as a protagonist, like she knows who she is from the get, like she, she knows who she is. She's 17 years old. And I think it's important to show that, um, cause there's this weird notion that like kids are too young to know who they are. Um, and I really wanted to show, you know, a strong young queer character uh, in making this film. Um, and so that's something I know, you know, would have been special to me uh, in my younger years. And I hope that this movie will be, you know, a source of comfort for queer teens uh, that are coming into their own. Thank you. And to wrap it up, Jess and Rick, the same. Yeah, you know, I'm going to continue a little bit of the, the theme that Ariel started. I mean, you know, there's a lot of value to saying that, you know, we have women directors at the table, we have Asian American directors at the table. And I think those labels, I mean, those labels are like undoubtedly important right now because, you know, when it comes to like any marginalized group, you have to carve a space for yourself. And those labels are necessary sometimes, but it would just be such a breath of fresh air to see, you know, in narrative, more queer and trans characters where that aspect of their personality is not their plot point. Although, like Ariel said, you know, having films that focus on that experience are very important. You know, it's just so refreshing whenever I see someone who's just living authentically as a character and we get to experience that queer side of their personality and we feel it, we learn about it. And people who might not know that much about that community, they get to experience that through the film but it's not the centerpiece. And I think the more that we put ourselves out there and we create this type of media, I think the easier and easier it is um, to see more of that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I take a lesson from Harvey Milk and, and this and that visibility is key. You know, so the more that, that, that we're out there the, and seen and the more that youth can see these things, the, 
the, the better it will be. I mean, the dream is, right, that, that we don't use these qualifiers. And that, I mean, even with, and one thing I love about, about Hamilton, the, the musical, is that it just really said, oh, we don't care about race. And so it just, and it opened up this, this avenue for it, like anything can happen. And, I, and, and so when it comes to race and gender and sexual identity and all of that, it'd be great if, if, if it just was something you saw all the time. You know, and, and oh, I just, I mean, I could talk for hours about this. I feel so passionate about it. it, it representation is so important. And, you know, when I was a kid, I remember I loved this made for TV movie. It probably explains like my whole life and why I like Air Supply so much and Hallmark movies. Um, but it, it was called Doing Time on Maple Drive. And, you know, the, the main character was this troubled gay kid who tried to kill himself. Uh, it was Jim. It was a very dramatic role for Jim Carrey, too. He played the brother who was an alcoholic. Um, but it just that's what everything was. And I started seeing every time there was a gay character on television or in a movie, there was there was a problem and they were told that they weren't accepted. And so even seeing that as a kid, that's how I knew that I that there was something wrong with me. And so when we get into today and seeing films and seeing shows, it's it's so important that it's not a problem. And I was watching, um, I mean, this, I'm a big fan of CBS too, I have terrible taste in everything. Um, but there's this, <laughs> there's this new show called Rabbit Hole um, and there's an FBI agent, because I love FBI agent shows, and she goes up to the main character and, and he's like, you're late. And she's like, well, my, or, or he said to her, why can't your wife take care of your kid? And that's all they said, and they moved on. And you know, she was a lesbian. And I, I, I mean, I thought, wow, there was just a lesbian character introduced to the show, and nobody cared. And there wasn't this big drama about how horrible her life is. And I, I was like, wow, we might be well on our way to to getting this dream. So I, I think that's super important. And I actually want to add to that point real quick. Like, I think one thing that all three of our films have in common is that they are kind of optimistic in a way. I mean, there is like a lightness to all of these stories. And that was something that was brought up, you know, at our screening on Monday is like, you know, how do you feel about, you know, having this optimistic take? And it's it's like it's not necessarily I think that any of us really want to portray things as being perfect or conflicts as being unresolved because obviously, as we know, especially in the state, they are not. Um, but I think, you know, to Rick's point, like, it, I think it is really important to show those queer wins and those queer moments of like joy and euphoria because, you know, we need to, we need to be bolstered by those things to continue to fight. Thank you so much. Air supply? Uh, I just want you to know I was driving from St. Pete to Orlando last night and I saw a billboard that Air Supply is playing at Bush Gardens on Saturday and I hope it's after the screening of the show because I'm driving there to see them. Well, thank you. And, and like I started by saying um, visibility and representation are important. So thank you for the amazing work that you've created and are sharing with um, Orlando and our greater community. I appreciate each and every person on the panel and your film and your work. Um, so kudos and bravo to you all. And with that, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. And I believe Tim is up there, and he's got the mic. Yeah, I'm going to give the mic to Brad. And uh, just raise your hand. He'll bring the microphone over to you all to ask your question. I do also want to say, as a representative of the Florida Film Festival, that yes, Greetings from Queer Town and Evan Ever After are um, pre-sales are sold out. But if you come to the theater for the night of the screening, we will do everything in our power, to humanly possible, to get you into this movie to see it. So. George, Brad. Um, what were some of your biggest challenges or the biggest challenge in making your film? And uh, on the flip side of that, what was your favorite part about making the film that you made? I'm gonna go maybe left to right <laughs> um yeah well I, I definitely want to hear marnie what marnie's challenges were i think um for us it, it's a good problem to have but the first thing that comes to mind is you know when you're making a documentary we kind of came down here 
to film Evan and to film Marnie and to film the story, not really knowing, like we were like, let's just get everything we can. Let's capture as much footage as humanly possible. And then in the edit kind of like shape what the story is gonna be based on the footage that we get. So we were really lucky. We came down here for I think an entire week and we had like 30 plus hours of footage that we had to cut down to 15 minutes. And it's just, you know, with I'm used to narrative where you have a script that you can follow. So of course you have a lot of room in the edit, but at least you have like a guideline, a basis of the story that you're following. But we could have probably made like 20 different versions of a 15 minute documentary about Evan. Um, so it was just really hard like parsing out because there was so much that, you know, we would have loved to use. Um, so it was just, it was challenging to figure out like exactly which thread we wanted to draw and how we wanted to tell the story. Um, and yeah, there, there's definitely room for more and there were things that we were so sad to cut out, but it just, you know, in terms of how we were shaping the story didn't quite fit. Um, yeah. I think the biggest challenge for me honestly was just having, you know, a group of people that you don't know first in your house. <laughs> and, um, but I quickly fell in love with everybody. Everybody was wonderful. Um, I have other, you know, Evan's the youngest of three, so it was also kind of coordinating schedules, and I have two big dogs, and like making sure, like, people, this is going to be on film, and, you know, trying to keep my house clean, and um, I was amazed, like I said, that they had over 30 hours of footage to be able to bring that down, so when I saw the documentary and saw what, what 30 hours came down to, was really impressive to me, because I thought, wow, there was, there was a lot that you had to work with, um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it could have been a really difficult, you know, it could have been hard for me, you know, having strangers and following you around and, and they made it really, really easy. So I was, I was really pleased with the whole experience. Everything was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, there was nothing that was easy. Everything was uphill. <laughs> Um, and, you know, COVID-19, the pandemic happened like right in the middle of our uh, production plan. We were supposed to shoot the movie in the summer of 2020. Obviously, we couldn't really proceed with that safely. So we ended up uh, postponing by a full year. Um, we made this movie on a micro budget. I mean, like a teeny tiny fraction of what narrative features are typically made on. Uh, most of the people working on this movie were between the ages of 18 and 25, myself included. Uh, most of us had never made a feature before. Um, so it was a lot of calling in favors, uh, working around obstacles. I could tell you a million stories about the things that we had to do the hard way uh, to make them happen. But I think it was all worth it to, to get to where we're at. <sighs> Challenge. <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting that um, I think in an ideal world, we would have spent, I mean, like, I could have spent days on days on days with these people. I mean, and Rick knows, I mean, we could have lived in their house if we wanted to. I mean, it was just, they were all amazing. But in our production situation, we really had to be tactical about what we captured and when, which obviously is, a, you know, documentary filmmakers fairly challenging because you, you want to hang around, you kind of want to wait for the moments to happen. Um, but fortunately, you know, we just had really generous, you know, subjects that were willing to be flexible and willing to pour their hearts out um, within a session, which I think kind of leads me to, you know, what I think my most rewarding point was. It was really just the fact that, you know, we eventually got to this level of trust with some of our subjects where they were willing to cry and open up old traumas and talk about these really personal parts of their life. And it was just, you know, really precious to me that we, you know, I feel, I do feel like we successfully made that a safe space. Um, and yeah, that's the one thing that stands out to me. Yeah, time was really a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, we I, I'm involved in a company that puts out a newspaper every two weeks and these magazines and we're at events all the time and coordinating that with Adrenaline Film schedule and all the projects that they were working on, it was difficult and maybe why this span. I think once Adrenaline came on board though, it only was about a year and a half uh, mm -hmm. that it took to, to get the whole project done. Um, but as far as, you know, my favorite part of it, um, I, I mean, this, <laughs> Probably sounds so lame to say, but uh, Tiana Langley, who is um, the producer on it, and I was the executive producer, and Jess is the director. We formed a family. 
You know, we there is yeah. nothing that will rift this bond that we have. And if this project goes anywhere, it is the three of us that are going to take it where it's going. And um, we, I mean, it was, it, Jess said earlier about like the song and how we bonded over it. I mean, yeah, we would just Zoom call each other and play the song because <laughs> we needed to. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. And the amount of, of passion and work, I mean, it's just, dumb luck that um that that they got assigned to this project you know through adrenaline and that they're they're just so talented and and i just i love it so much i i do just want to point out too marnie that you're divine in this and and it's you know you're living in it so it may be hard for you to see but for somebody who grew up without that like you're gonna be an inspiration to to parents that's so sweetie thank you i also just wanted to say real quick one of the the most positive things that came out of this specific experience for us was, you know, like I said, I have three three children. So I have Evan, who's the youngest. I have a son um, who's 21, and I have a daughter that's uh, going to be 25. So I have three children raised in the same house by two parents. My husband is at work. He's very supportive, um, and they're all very different. So um, this all happened very quickly with Evan coming out as transgender and all of this kind of national attention. And my middle son is, you know, went to the same high, they all went to the same high school. But, you know, he is, was a very typical jockey, varsity football player, varsity lacrosse player. And he had never met any other trans people before meeting um, Leo and Ariel. And it was huge for him because, you know, he's looking at it as I've now lost my brother, right? And now I'm trying to grapple with the fact that I now have a sister and they're only two years apart. So they had a very close relationship growing up. So there's there's that dynamic as well. And everything you hear and everything you see is, is pretty negative, right? In the media about trans people and the language that's used around them. And so I think that he's had and still continues to have a lot of fear about the life that Evan is going to have. And so meeting Ariel and Leo, um, it makes me a little choked up, was really, um, really life-changing, you know, because it, it not only shows Evan, but it also shows my other children, like, you know, they're trans people, just, they're, they're people like everybody else. It's, it's just one part of who you are, like Evan is trans, but she really is just a 19-year-old girl that wants to make TikToks and go get her nails done and, hang out with her friends and have a boyfriend, you know, and all these, all these things that all these other kids want. She shouldn't have to be thinking about, am I going to get arrested if I go into a woman's bathroom? Right. So, um, and that, that's where we are. So that's scary. So for me, just getting them and having my kids get to meet other trans people, um, was really the best part of the whole experience. And I thank you for that too, because for me, it's not a thought, right? Like your job as a parent is like, you're there for your kids. So it, it, I don't understand how anybody could think any other way. So it's not a conscious, it's not a conscious decision where my husband and I sat down and said, okay, well, are we gonna be, you just, you are, I mean, these are your kids, right? So any parent who doesn't follow that route, I, I can't understand that and shame on you. That's, that's how I feel. Yeah, well, I was, I was at this event last night in St. Pete, and it was a benefit for a P-flag of, of Riverview. And and I just, what I was thinking about was how, I mean, they may be supportive, but like new parents who go to this, who, who, who are finding out that they have queer kids, watching you in this film will help them so much because there's so many great things that you have to say. And, and my favorite, really, because I've always kind of grappled with this myself and trying to say to my parents, like, well, this is new to them. I have to give them time. But for you to say, you know, this is not new for, for my daughter, so right. I need to catch up. We have up. to catch up. I, right. I thought that was brilliant. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for your work because um, I actually am one of the other filmmakers, and my story is about a trans person, but that's not the main story. The trans person's just in it. So to hear people validate that, and then also to see, like, I think I see the director of She's Clean also have like trans representation without that being like trans trauma necessarily. I feel like that's such a huge step and it just like warms my heart. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say thank you for all that, for all the filmmakers who are doing that. 
and for the um, Florida Film Festival, who's collecting such a great collection. Anyway, sorry to divulge, but um, I kind of wanted to ask for for Queer Town. Um, I was wondering if you guys were maybe considering releasing an educational package, kind of like you know Ken Burns, how he does the educational packages with his stuff. Because you guys have so many great historical pictures that I think I would absolutely love to know the stories behind and all the stuff that maybe like, well, not all the stuff, because I know you guys said like, there's a lot, but like, <laughs> you know, all the stuff that you left out, I feel like there's a lot of cool stuff to be learning from that. Um, so is there any kind of plan for that at all? We, we hadn't discussed, that's an amazing idea, first of all. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, one thought that did occur to me off the bat though, is like, we have these very long, um, interviews that are strung out, you know, they do have string outs in a premiere project somewhere, right? That are just such important, at minimum, archival content for the community. You know, so I would love, I mean, that's a, that's a conversation that Rick and I need to have, but I would love for those to be at least available in some sort of unedited format. But yeah, I mean, we hadn't discussed that, but I think that's an incredible idea. Yeah, it is a great idea. When I, <laughs> When, you know, when I thought at the beginning of this process that I would raise $200,000, <laughs> that we would have this opportunity to say, you know, we're going to get, you know, 20 people or so that we're going to interview and we're going to talk to them about, you know, coming out. We're going to talk to them about the AIDS crisis. We're going to talk to them about pride and we're going to talk to them about the future, that kind of thing. But we're going to pull some of those for this documentary. But then we've got the interviews. So now we could do 45 minute shorts of mm -hmm. um of okay well here's gina duncan talking about all of these things yeah. or here's you know and so everybody would have their individual piece and that's just something that would live in some kind of archival history uh that is i mean we've got all the we've got the interviews that we did and if we have the ability to do more that's something i would love to see happen i'd also like to mention um there's an incredible project that i had the privilege of working on called outwards i don't know if anyone's familiar but they archive interviews of LG, LGBT people, I think over 65, I think 65 is the cutoff. Mm -hmm. um, and I had actually interviewed um, with Patty Sheehan and Tom Dyer prior to this film, <laughs> just a funny coincidence for that. But that's an, also an incredible resource if you wanna go on and find some incredible stories. I'd love to do something similar with this film. And just to let you know, another resource here in town is the um, Central Florida LGBTQ History Museum. And they Which do have- heavily. They have yeah. archives online as well as um, an exhibit at the LGBT Center, 946 North Mills. And I feel like they're working on a documentary about the Parliament House, aren't they? I believe that they are. Um, so um, I know that they're getting ready to switch out their their um, exhibit at the center, um, but they have a very robust um archival process that UCF was helping them with. So um, there's there's a lot there. Um, they have history from the beginning all the way um, to probably 2016. And then after that, I don't know what they have, but um, they've got some really great history. Um, right now, the exhibit is um, Drag Queens of Orlando, and they have um, Gay Bars of Orlando, and they also have um, one specifically on come out with pride one specifically on the center one specifically on different organizations um so i just wanted to give a shout out to them because they are also a great resource in town hello everybody thank you um i have a question for ariel um two follow-up questions actually to get into the nitty-gritty of both how you ultimately chose the narrative you chose out of the 20 films you could have told, um, uh, stories you could have told, and also how you build trust on sets doing documentary film with your subjects. Yeah, thank you, both both very important things. Um, I think in terms of, you know, I'm new to documentary filmmaking, Rada has experience with it before, so she kind of helped to guide both of us in terms of how to shape the story. Um, but when we came down here, you know, we were drawn by the hook of first trans homecoming queen in the state of Florida, viral, you know, viral fame, Ellen, all of that was like the hook that drew us in. But once we started getting to know Evan and Marnie and their family, we realized that that 
was really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the complexity of the family and the complexity of who Evan is. And one of the things that became immediately clear to us from the beginning, which was then just further emphasized while we were down here, um, is just about Evan's confidence. You know, that was the word that just kept coming back to us, confidence, confidence, confidence. Because she, you know, first, as a lot of trans people do, myself included, <coughs> she first came out as gay. Um, and she, she talks about, and this is something we unfortunately didn't have the time to include, but in freshman year of high school, she came out as gay. And then a couple years later, she came out as trans. And when she came out as trans, and you know, Marnie can fact check me if I'm being too pie in the sky about it, but at least from my experience, when she came out as trans, there was no asking permission. There was no subtle peeking out of the closet. It was like, oh, you know what? I'm a woman, boom. Went back to school and just that's who she was. She just was a woman, she was trans. This is who she is. You're gonna either accept it or you're gonna, you know, GTFO. Um, and that was just so incredible, like to just not ask for permission to be who you are. I mean, it's, a, it's such a novel concept, but it was so impressive and so exciting. So when we were in the, in the editing room and we were trying to figure out what the narrative was, we just kept coming back to this idea of confidence and sort of building this arc of, of Evan's confidence, inspiring not only herself and her family, but inspiring her community. Um, so I think that like we, for, what, for us, what worked is choosing this theme, confidence, and then like making sure that we were building a, a story that shows the confidence piece throughout. Um, and then also wanted to make sure that we're including the regional and national politics as well. So we have clips in there um, of the lovely governor and of like some of the ways that that's been covered just because we wanna show um, what, what her confidence has the ability to combat. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what worked for us. And then in terms of building trust and community, so that's part of why I feel so grateful to my co-director Rada because she and I, I think really balance each other out in terms of the communities that we represent. So we were, we were strategic in terms of who would conduct which interview at any given moment. So for example, we interviewed Hudson, um, Evan's brother. And when we did that, Rada conducted the interview and I actually wasn't in the room. And we did that intentionally because we wanted Evan, I mean, sorry, we wanted Hudson to feel like he could speak openly about everything, including the challenges that he felt because we wanted him to be unfiltered in, in his journey from you know hesitation to eventual total love and acceptance of Evan. Um, and then Rada also you know, conducted the interview with Marnie um, and Matt, Evan's father. Uh, Rada's a mother, Rada is from Orlando. Um, Rada, again, is a cisgender heterosexual ally. So she you know, has that, that motherly warmth and motherly understanding that hopefully made Marnie feel seen and understood. Um, but then when it came to the trans specific interviews, I was conducting those. So I did the interview with Evan. I did the interview um, with Lex, Evan's trans friend. And then I also have a background in LGBTQ youth work. So before moving into film, I worked at a queer youth theater um, out of Boston. And so I've, I've experienced working specifically with queer youth. So I kind of have that in terms of connection. So I think the fact that we were co-directors really helped in terms of like sort of tag teaming, creating spaces where everybody could feel welcome depending on who, what their identity was. Thank you. Hi, uh, this question is for everybody. Um, I'm a queer person who works in the, in the industry and I often find that working on queer films can be really healing and therapeutic for myself. Um, and I was wondering if anyone had any moments that um, that you might wanna share that some, something that really surprised you or inspired you to, to continue to do this really important work and, and uh, you know, tell these these really important stories uh, that we all really need to see. Oh, I, I don't mind starting. Um, yeah, there definitely one thing I I that seemed to be a running theme. 
throughout doing this in the interviews that we were doing and the, the subjects we were talking to, it seemed that they had one single act of kindness in mind that they wanted to do. And, you know, I'll take Sam Ewing, for example. He wanted to honor his friend who passed. He said, his life can't be in vain. I want to do one thing. And that thing blew up into something that saved thousands of lives. And I, I just thought that that was fantastic. I mean, it was just, there's so many stories like that. But the, the one that I realized uh, early, early on and how it affected me is kind of a, a long story, so I apologize. I don't know what time we have. But I came out when I was 16 years old. And I, I waited for my parents to take my brother to his baseball game, and I grabbed the phone book, and I looked up the word gay. And at the time, there was, it was gay plumbing, which is now Frank Gay, I think, because maybe he didn't <laughs> want to, I mean, gay plumbing. Yeah. And then gay and lesbian community services. And so I, um, I guess I didn't want any trace of me trying to contact this, so I didn't call, you know, in case it showed. I mean, this is back when you used to get phone bills with the phone numbers you called on it. So I just jumped on a bus and I went there and I paced around forever. I was afraid that somebody that knew my parents or knew me would see me try to walk up into this building. And I, I sort of finally got the courage and the door was locked, which I'm grateful for because I had this really stupid image of what I was going to see when I went in there because of what I saw of TV and the movies, you know, that it was just going to be this, you know, free for all drug orgy kind of a thing. And, <laughs> and, and it, you know, so different. Um, so I went home and I called the number and that number led me to Jeff Horn, who had started the Delta Youth Alliance, which is now the Orlando Youth Alliance. At that time, Tom Dyer uh, was, or a couple of years into it, Tom Dyer became a mentor for that youth group who started Watermark, who then hired me when I, you know, was looking for work when I was 27. And so I feel like this community raised me. You know, and I, I met these people very early on. I was very lucky. And that just set the path of my whole life. Calling that number set the path of my whole life. And during the interview process, we found that the reason that number was was even in the phone book was because somebody fought to have it there. And that the phone company wouldn't put it in the phone book because it didn't um, or it, it didn't follow their values. And so he fought for that number to be there years before I looked it up. And that had such a profound effect on my life. And so that was the most, that was the wonderful surprise for me in all of that. Yeah, I love your story. <laughs> um, God, yeah, wow. it's, it's interesting um, for me because, you know, anyone who's close to me, anyone who knows me close on any level knows that I'm queer. But, you know, when I used to work at Adrenaline and I interviewed for that job, you know, it's not really something that comes up in a job interview necessarily when I'm like, oh, by the way, I'm kind of gay. Um, it, it, that's not how it works. However, <laughs> um, I, you know, interestingly enough, anytime there was like a queer project, they'd always be like, I think this fits you, Jess. Like, I think, I think you should maybe like talk to this client or this person. Right. Um, so, but for me, I'm kind of in a really weird, uh, position and I hope somebody here, like in the audience or online relates to this because it's a weird niche, but I'm a millennial, um, and I'm bisexual. So there's a lot of a heavy amount of like heteronormativity that went into play for my whole teenage years. You know, I came out really late in life. I'm still kind of, I mean, I'm, I've been out for a while privately, but I'm kind of having a little bit of, of more of a public experience now. Um, and so like for me, you know, being able to make this film and contribute in this way, like really meant everything to me because it felt like the most supportive appropriate, you know, right way that I could possibly, you know, contribute my talents and express myself as a queer person. Um, and I think also, you know, going through this process too, you know, like I, you know, I like Rick, I didn't necessarily have the experience of growing up with a lot of these people, but, you know, I have a lot of friends. I have some people in my life that like can't really transition right now or can't really come out. So it felt really good to be able to make that film and think like in some you know, small way, you know, I might not be able to help them in the way that they 100% need in their personal lives because they have obstacles right now, but I can help in this way. And that was, you know, it's just really healing for me. Yeah, kind of adding on to that, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I came up with the idea for Egghead and Twinkie when I was 19. So in a way, I've kind of grown up while making this film. Uh, and when I first came up with the idea, I was like, 
genuinely kind of scared to show it to anybody because I wasn't very confident in myself and in my queerness. Um, and I was afraid of being too much of like being too gay or one of those gay people that talks about being gay all the time, which is like terrible, you know, to, to feel that way. But I was kind of like censoring myself uh, in my art. You know, it was the first thing that I had ever made as a filmmaker that was about being gay. Um, and so, you know, this six year journey of, of making the film, um, it's really been a journey for me as well. And uh, making this movie has made me so much more confident in who I am and, and speaking about things that I care about. Um, and that's been a really cool thing because I'm like, I'm not afraid of, of that anymore. I feel very comfortable being here on this panel and, and talking about these issues that are very personal to me, um, which is just really cool um, that that happened through, through making this film. Um, and then as a little add on, I would say, you know, outside of myself, uh, one of the things that's been really gratifying has been um, going to screenings and getting people's feedback. Uh, and I always thought that I had made this film for young people like myself and for teens, uh, and it is. But I also think that it is for everyone because um, I've been really touched by older generations that have come up to me and been so moved by it. Uh, like we took the film to BFI Flair in London um, and I sat in on that screening and I could see this gentleman, he must have been maybe, I don't know, in his 60s, sitting in the front row. And I saw him go through this emotional journey while watching the movie. <laughs> like there was one point he was just crying. I see him like wiping away the tears and then he's like laughing through the tears. And I was just like living vicariously through this man. Um, and then at the end he came up and he told me how much it meant to him and how uh, he felt that it would help people. And that really made all of the challenges worth it. Um, I think my foray into the film industry was also kind of my foray into my trans identity um, because I, as I said, like I had this journey where first I came out as gay and then later came out as trans. And so the first film project that I ever made was this web series called Facades. Um, and it's about a non-binary trans feminine person coming into her identity. And I was making this movie as a gay man, or so I thought, who just was really interested in it, trans issues. I wonder why. Um, but <laughs> the actor that I that I ended up finding to play the lead role, her name is Maybe Burke. She's incredible, um, based in Philadelphia. And, and she was kind of the first, like, non-binary trans person, uh, trans feminine specifically person that I ever met. And just like meeting meeting her and getting to know her and getting to like see her live out this character that I had created um, that I thought was far more removed than actually was, was just a really exciting and empowering experience. And just like seeing her living her life and living her truth, like encouraged me to be able to do that as well. So yeah, for me, like the, the boundaries between art and personal life are like very thin. So it's a huge, uh, huge part of who I am. Well, I've been told we can wrap up. So <laughs> thank you all for joining us. And thank you to the Florida Film Festival for having me with a park library and this wonderful panel. Have a great day. Drive safe. Thank you, everyone.